everybody, welcome back to Private Club Radio. I'm your host, Denny Corby. Let's get poppin'. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Private Club Radio. I'm your host, Denny Corby. Welcome back to another fun episode. This episode, I get to chat with Mr. Joe Trager. And, you know, chatting with Joe... Um, and, you know, discussing, and he was just sharing kind of the, you know, the NCA's mission, he said, is to serve and empower private clubs through advocacy. Ooh, hate that word. I'm surprised I got through it. Uh, insights in, you know, the, the best governance practices. And uh, from there, he kind of highlighted the importance of really good governance, um, you know, things like including the need for really strong board leadership, uh, effective communication between board members, management, and club members themselves, uh, you know, super, super important. You know, I think the conversation really provides extremely valuable insights into the challenges and opportunities kind of facing private clubs and the role that NCA can really do in supporting your success, right? It's all about the clubs. So this is all about you. This is a really great episode. All right, let's get to the episode. Help me welcome CEO of the NCA, Mr. Joe Trogger. Here with you, um, Denny. But um, yeah, we've got a lot of good things happening here at the National Club Association. We have our National Club Conference that's coming up in the beginning of May, uh, May 7th through the 9th. And uh, that's always a, a special um, event for us. Um, it is our gathering of members and uh, our, our board meeting and, and that type of thing. But it's a chance for us to get together and hear from some, you know, industry leaders and business leaders, um, you know, policymakers, um, thinkers around the country um, and, and sort of get their perspectives on what's happening around the country and how it might impact um, private clubs um, or just things that private clubs need to be aware of moving forward. So we're excited this year. We're going to be in the Chicago area. Uh, we are having our main event at the Union League Club of Chicago. Uh, we're having our chairman's dinner at, uh, and reception at Medina Country Club on Sunday. Uh, we are doing our governance symposium, which is something that we do each year at our national club conference. It's sort of a conference within a conference for club presidents and board members. Um, it's an opportunity for them to get together and um, talk about the challenges that they face as club presidents and, and board members. Um, as a recovering club president myself, um, it was something that I, I really enjoyed um, my first time attending it. And um, it's just a good opportunity to kind of hear from other your colleagues around the, around the country and, and, and see how they're handling things and, and different things that their clubs are doing that might be of use um, or lessons that you can learn from, from other people's uh, experiences. David Walker, who's the former U.S. Comptroller of, um, uh, of the United States, um, he has a new book out, um, kind of looking at the uh, at the the state of the country in a, on a thirty thousand foot level and sort of what that means for us in, in a global context. Um, so he's you know very steeped in a lot of the budget issues and and things that um, you know the the really big picture items that I think uh, will be a great way to kind of kick off the conference and kind of think about things in a, in a more global perspective. Um, and then immediately after uh, Mr. Walker, we'll have Michael Schemo, who is um, the former club president of Medina Country Club and um, really is credited with really getting Medina Country Club and their governance system back on track um, after sort of some some issues that they ran into. Um, he is a distinguished club president um, recognized across the country. So he will sort of kick things off in a plenary session. And then the uh, governance symposiums of the club members uh, will then go into their own session and uh, we'll continue with our sort of, um, you know, club professionals and that kind of thing uh, in the plenary sessions. Then that afternoon, we'll have um, we're bringing back the golf tournament to our uh, national club conference, and uh, we'll be doing that at Lakeshore Country Club. And everybody's very excited about that. That's sponsored by Clubworks, and um, so it, it'll, it should be a great, great event. Um, and we're happy to have that back uh, as part of our conference. Um, and then that night, we'll be doing um, our Excellence in Club Management Awards reception and dinner, where we recognize uh, four individuals for outstanding leadership in, in the club uh, community. 
And um, this is a, an award that's been around for, I believe, 25 or 26 years. And um, it is just last year was the first year that we brought it into the National Club Conference. Um, it's a joint uh, award from the National Club Association and the McMahon Group. Um, and the dinner and reception will be um, uh, sponsored by Copland, Keebler and Wallace. Um, so it's a great, great event and a, a chance to recognize, um, you know, really excellent uh, club managers um, every year. So we're excited to have that as part of our national club conference. And then on Tuesday, the final day, uh, we'll have a number of uh, education sessions and, and speakers, including uh, the first female Commodore of the Chicago, Chicago Yacht Club. Um, Chicago Yacht Club's been around for, I think, around 150 years or so. And she's the first uh, female Commodore. So we'll 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 hear from her, and she's also a, a, a judge. Um, so, you know, some interesting perspectives, I'm sure. Um, and we'll also have uh, among the many speakers we'll have. We have Curtis Duffy, who's a Chicago uh, restaurateur, um, owner of Ever Restaurant in Chicago, and I believe he has multiple Michelin stars for uh, his work in the restaurant industry. And um, so we're excited to have him there as well, kind of share his perspective on uh, food and beverage um, trends and that kind of thing, but also his connection with private clubs. Um, you know, he started off in, in the kitchen of a private club and really, um, from what I understand, kind of credits that for, um, you know, a lot some of the success that he's had. Um, throughout his career. So it's a great conference. I'm looking forward to it. We're, we continue to add speakers um, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're just looking forward to it tremendously. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be my, my first time there. I'm actually coming in very, very, very excited. And I hear it's a very intimate conference, which is always yeah. like, that's always been the ones that I've gone to for the most part. Cause like most of the ones uh, even like, but like outside like my industry, if I like perform at them, they're usually like smaller conferences, like two, three, 400 people. And it's just like the cool experience, like just the, 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 the connectivity of just everyone together, uh, is just yeah. such a, such a different di dynamic than when there's like thousands. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a little bit, um, counterintuitive when you say it's an intimate conference. Um, but it, it is, it's much, it's, it's a very different feel from a lot of the conferences that, that occur, um, you know, whichever, you know, wherever they are. Um, but we try to create um, um, an, an experience where um, the group is is together uh, for most of the time, if not all of the time, uh, you dine together. Um, so there's built in within that, there's a lot of networking opportunities and just time, you know, to be able to spend with your colleagues, uh, get to know folks that you may not know all that well. Um, and, and it's, really a, a kind of curated experience, um, it, for a conference. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, I, I, think it's having attended, I don't know how many conferences over the course of my career, um, in different industries. Um, I, I really believe that this is a, this is just a special event. Um, it, it has a lot of unique features. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great one to put on and, and we're, we're happy to do so every year. It's going to be a blast. And it's May 7th through the 9th. Correct. In May Chicago. In Chicago. And, you, and, we, and there's still still spots open? People can still still yes. sign up? Yes, there are. Uh, we we have uh, room for 300 people. It's it's closing fast, but I um, encourage folks to to get online and, and uh, register um, for for the conference. Um, I believe our, our main lodging has filled up but we do have um, auxiliary lodging um, just a block or so away. So um, yeah, encourage folks to sign up. Over at the W. Indeed. Indeed. And rates are really not that bad for downtown Chicago. Uh. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. And I should add, um, so we, we I mentioned the uh, main event will be at the Union League uh, Club of Chicago, um, but the Excellence in Club Management Award will be at the University Club. Um, in Chicago. So we're moving around different venues. Um, so folks will be able to see different clubs. And, and that's another aspect of our, our conference that people really enjoy is the opportunity to go out and see different clubs and how they operate. And when you called it a curated experience that that nails it perfectly. <laughs> so why don't you catch us up to speed? You are new, fairly new. Why don't you uh, kind of give us the 30,000 
3,000 foot foot view? You know, are you a, a Coke guy, a Pepsi guy? Sure. Um, cats, um, dogs? Yeah. So um, <laughs> actually, uh, I, I joined the NCA four years ago, um, April 8th. Um, and the reason I remember it as April 8th is because it's always Master's Week. Um, so I look forward to Master's Weeks on, on, on different fronts. Um, but at any rate, uh, I joined as the vice president of, of government relations. And um, last year, we had a, a transition with some of our leadership. And um, I was asked to, to be the CEO, uh, president and CEO in October officially. Um, so I've been at it for uh, since October 1st, really. And um, it's been a great uh great experience. Um, I, I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, you know, I've been in the private club industry, if you w- want to call it that, um, for a number of years prior to that and in, in a, in a volunteer leadership role, um, serving on the board of my club country club, and obviously being members of, of multiple clubs, um, over the years. Um, but it's, it, I've, I've found that that experience uh, serving on a board of a country club, um, you know, from a government relations standpoint, but also as an association um, executive, um, really provides a, a, a good perspective on what the expectations are and, and kind of trying to anticipate what the needs are going to be of clubs um, moving in the future. So, yeah, it's been I, I'm relatively new in the CEO role, but I've uh, been with the organization for four years and I do prefer Coke over Pepsi. Um, I do have a dog. Um, been asked for a cat, uh, my daughters, but uh, that's <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> I, I, you know, cats are great, but I, I just uh, with, with our dog, I, I'm not sure it would survive very long. <laughs> and what kind of dog? Um, it's a German Shepherd Husky mix. Oh. Um, it's a be- he's a beautiful dog. His name is Nolan. And um, he's, uh, yeah, he's pretty, um, his hunt in- instinct is pretty pronounced. So, hmm. like I said, I don't think a cat would survive very long. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but uh, no, other things, I guess, just for me, um, you know, obviously I mentioned I've been a member of a club uh, for yeah. a while. Probably one thing that folks don't re- really realize is I, I did compete in, in amateur golf um, a little bit and, um, you know, through the golf channels tour thing and and qualified for the national championship there the first year it was happening hmm. and um, that kind of thing. So golf is a, has been an important part of my life and um um uh, looking to maybe get back into a little bit of competitive environment here in the future hmm. so to be continued <laughs> yeah that's that's the that's the cliffhanger for the for this episode <laughs> <laughs> um do you want to bring up uh, or talk about the florida stuff the fiddlesticks. Sure. So yeah, we, we actually, um, so there was, there was a case that occurred uh, um, down in Florida, uh, the club is fiddlesticks country club, um, where they went through some governance changes and, um, had adopted, adopted some new bylaws, um, that changed the way that their, um, the, any future assessments were handled. Um, in the past, they had uh, been 100% refundable assessments. Once you sell your property in, in the community, um, you would get that money back. And they recognized a while back that that was not really a model that was going to be sustainable. Um, so they changed the bylaws. They went through the you know the process. They had their member meetings and the members voted and they voted to um, make the future assessments non-refundable. And uh, a number of Members were not happy with that and filed suit against the club uh, for essentially uh, for lack of, you know, for for the sake of brevity, I'll just say for violating the contractual arrangement they had when they joined the club, which is that all of the assessments would be refundable. Um, You know, if you look into Florida law and you you look into how clubs are run, it just I mean, it doesn't work that way. Right. I mean, you you have bylaws, you have a, a means to amend those bylaws. Um, and, um, it, it's all been done by the process and you're inevitably in any sort of democratic process, you're going to have people who are not satisfied with the outcome. Um, it, it, only on rare occasions do you get a, um, an anonymous, you know, unanimous vote 
um, on something, particularly when it has to do with money. Um, so at any rate, um, the judge in the lower court ruled in the plaintiff's favor, meaning that um, the club and essentially it goes beyond fiddlesticks um, because the, the implication here is if the ruling stands that any club that's changed its bylaws would that would now based upon this ruling, essentially have to abide by the bylaws that were in effect the, at the moment that each member joined the club. So you can imagine the administrative <laughs> nightmare that this creates, and it's completely standing the Florida law on its head. So oh, yeah. at any point, at any rate, the club uh, appealed that decision, um, you know, it, wisely. And in that process, uh, NCA asked to um, submit an amicus brief um, to the court um, last year. And we filed that, that amicus brief and, and basically, you know, raised a, a, a number of points that I've already gotten into. You know, the administrative nightmare it is, the, the fact that it turns the law on its head, um, you know, that these bylaws are, are not themselves a contract uh, with the individual member, um, but they are a guide you know, the guidelines under which a club is governed, um, you know, it was, a, I thought it was a very strongly uh, written brief. And we just had oral arguments back on March 2nd in the sixth, the Florida sixth district of appeals. And we had, we had hoped to have that uh, oral argument happen in a decision already, but Florida went through a, a change in their district courts. And this sixth district is, is the, a brand new court district in the state of Florida. And this case, Fiddlesticks case, was the very first case that they heard um, for this for this new district. And um, so I was down there um, and, and attended the the arguments. Um, you know, it, it's always dangerous to get a you know to to, to predict um, or try to predict what a court's going to do based upon oral arguments. But um, you know, I think we came away feeling like we had made our points, um, that the law is on our side, and now we're just waiting. Um, to get a, a final ruling from the three judge panel um, in the in that appeal, so we'll see how it goes. But like I said, I, I think that the the law is clearly on our side. But um, um, you know, strange things happen sometimes. We, we had gone out to uh, Florida clubs because the, the the ruling really would have been the it would have been isolated, lack of a better word, to clubs in Florida. So what we did as an organization was we we went out to clubs in Florida and asked them to support our efforts to, um, you know, draft up this this legal argument and present it. Um, and we, we received a tremendous amount of support from clubs around the state and uh, were able to offset the costs of of that uh, legal proceeding for us, um, you know, and that's those are things that we'll look to do uh, from time to time as they come up. Um, you know, and, and be able to to um, enlist the support of clubs in in a particular state if it's a legal proceeding in in that state, um, that kind of thing. But obviously, you know, w when you're looking at whether it's legal or legislative or regulatory actions, um, these things have a way of multiplying. Um, and and you know what happens in Florida could eventually happen in Virginia, could eventually happen in Maryland. You know these things kind of snowball and spread. So we want to make sure that uh, we're staying on top of these things at, at, at the state level um, and deal with them there so that we can prevent it from from traveling other places. Um, you know, it's a it's a well-known saw in legislative worlds that no no bad idea dies. It just sort of takes a new shape and, and travels a little bit. Um, so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah. I, on government relations issues, um, you, you know, I mentioned early on in the in our conversation that things started off kind of slowly because we had a delay in the speaker election um, that lasted a week. Um, and that sort of, you know, snowballed into delays in other areas um, like the committees weren't formed. Um, we didn't have committee chairmen, um, you know, in Congress um, on the House side. And so that kind of leads to further delays. And so the legislation has been fairly slow. So because of the speaker election delay, um, everything kind of got boxed up and um, that's starting to kind of break free now. Um, we, you know, we're mid-March, late March. And um, 
you know, the hearings are really picking up. Uh, we're going to see some movement on border issues, immigration, probably next week. Um, so things are really starting to pick up a little bit in the House um, in terms of legislation. But on the regulatory front, th- th- that's always sort of a, a slow, steady march. And um, there's a number of different regulations that we're keeping an eye on or and or weighing in in opposition to, um, you know, things that affect clubs like the independent contractor class, you know, worker classification issue is something that um, the Department of Labor has been working on. Um, NCA and CMAA actually filed comments together in opposition to that regulation. Um, You have the waters of the U.S. definition of, um, you know, what the United States, uh, the, what the federal government has jurisdiction over in terms of bodies of water, um, that went into effect um, on March 20th. Um, there was a, fe- a federal judge down in the state of Texas that um, that enjoined that rule from going into effect in Texas and Idaho. Um, there are a number of different lawsuits. I think it's four or five. Uh, most notably uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the American Petroleum Institute, um, and the Farm Bureau Bureau that have filed lawsuits against the waters of the U.S. rule. And um, it's very possible that we could see, um, you know, further action by the courts, whether it's a, you know, regional injunction or a national injunction um, against the rule, that is uh, definitely possible. And sort of dovetailing with that, um, the House a couple of weeks ago passed a, a a joint resolution under the Congressional Review Act, uh, which is a sort of privilege process that has its own sort of rules, uh, which I won't go into, but um, they they voted to repeal the rule. Um, It's now in the Senate. It's possible the Senate could actually pass it. It has bipartisan support. Um, The the difficulty about these kind of uh, resolutions on the Congressional Review Act is that the president actually still needs to sign it into law. Um, And since this president's administration is the one that promulgated the rule, the likelihood of that um, him signing that into law is pretty, pretty uh, slim and and none. Um, So, you know, but it's a a process that puts Congress on the record as uh, opposing, opposing the rule. So, that's uh, on the EPA side. Uh, other issues w- that Department of Labor is looking at, we, we have been expecting for quite some time a proposed rule on updating the overtime threshold, the minimum threshold that you need to pay somebody to be considered exempt employee under uh, overtime regulations. Um, we haven't seen that yet. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's difficult to predict when uh, we might. Um, the regulatory agenda doesn't really give us much guidance um, in terms of when we might see that. But uh, I would expect sometime, uh, obviously, later this spring and possibly into the summer, we'll, we'll see a proposed rule on that. And um, depending on what it's uh, what it contains, um, we very well could come out in opposition to it. I did meet with the Department of Labor, uh, Wage and Hour Division and then the Assistant Secretary of Labor last year about the issue and gave them our perspective. So hopefully, um, you know, they'll take into consideration um, the concerns of clubs moving forward on that rule. But um, there's a number of others that we're keeping an eye on, but I would say those are probably the big ones. How can people help? No. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good question. And, you know, I think one of the things that I always appreciate, um, and, and I think any person who's engaged in government relations would, would agree um, that, you know, having members be able to articulate what sort of impact, you know, particular laws or regulations will have on their operations, I think provides, a, you know, some good insights that we can share with members of Congress. Um, and obviously, you know, many of the clubs that um, are part of the National Club Association have relationships with their local, you know, congressmen or congresswoman, um, their senators, their local representatives, and 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 those types of uh, uh, policymakers. So encourage them to reach out to them and let them know what, what how they think about, um, you know, various issues that are uh, before Congress or even being considered, uh, you know, to be considered um, before Congress or, or from the regulatory bodies. So, uh, you know, much like uh, the club community, um, legislation is, is a lot about and regulatory work and, and government relations is a lot about building relationships. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, was really important to me coming in uh, with government relations here at the NCA was to make sure that we had relationships on both sides of the aisle. Um, 
you know, Republicans and Democrats, um, because uh, it's important to work with both sides. Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate you being on the show. You're a gentleman and a scholar. It was so great talking to him, and we're going to be having him on more, uh, doing you know occasional updates, what's going on in the industry, uh, interesting stories, just whatever can provide value to all of us as a whole to keep the industry moving forward. If you've made it this far, like I said in the beginning, I, we, us would love so much support over here on Private Club Radio. So if you want to share, like, give a little engagement, it really goes a long way. There's a lot of work uh, and time that goes into these episodes and just a little engagement, a little like, a little five-star rating, share it off to a friend, uh, really means the world. All right. You guys have a fantastic day, evening, night, whenever you're listening. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Private Club Radio.